Is this thing working? Yeah. 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 Um, let me begin by thanking all of you for taking time from your busy schedules to, uh, to join us today. <coughs> uh, we've invited you here for what amounts to a uh, sort of a town hall discussion of our continuing efforts to um, transform the Commonwealth's IT infrastructure into one uniform technology infrastructure. Um, as most of you all are aware, we are reaching a critical phase in the transformation process. We hope to have it completed, largely completed by, uh, especially for the large agencies, by July of uh, this year. So this morning, it is our intention to sort of um, update you on some of the changes we are proposing to the system as sort of a mid-course correction. Uh, in addition, uh, Secretary Chopra is prepared to uh, listen to your concerns as we try to proceed with some uh, uh, major revisions, uh, minor to some, but major to us, uh, to reform how we do IT in Virginia. Um, my role today is fairly limited. I do dabble in, in software from time to time, but I'm certainly no uh, IT guru. So when I uh, finish these opening remarks, I will quickly turn the podium over to Secretary Chopra and he will provide you more of the details on the changes we are considering or proposing to uh, VITA this legislative session. Um, since uh, 2002, I've had the good fortune of working in both the Warner and Kane administrations, and frankly, I'm very proud of the fact that in both of those administrations, uh, Governor Magazine honored uh, Virginia for being one of the top managed states. We have accomplished this in part because of the, uh, by instilling a performance-oriented culture in state government. Uh, and this, this performance-oriented culture is, is, is heavily reliant upon information technology as a, as a vehicle to help us conduct the state's business. Uh, to ensure long-term uh, focus on performance management, we are committed to this new, uh, this new IT system, which, as you know, is, is powered by a $1.9 billion contract <coughs> in a partnership with Northrop Grumman. This project was recently named by a peer group of CIOs as one of the nation's best enterprise IT initiatives. Now, I'm aware, I've heard from many of you, I heard from your agency directors, I've, I've heard from folks within and outside of VITA, that while this uh, IT infrastructure pro uh, program or project holds much promise, there are some uh, considerable challenges. I believe this, if this project is to reach its, uh, the potential that it that was, it was envisioned for it when it was conceived six years ago, um, VITA, Northrop Grumman, and the executive branch agencies that you represent will need to work to, uh, together to accomplish three things. First, there are some real cost pressures in the system that in a tight budget environment are simply not sustainable. Uh, we can uh, reduce these cost pressures, I believe, by the realization of administrative efficiencies in VITA and a more cost efficient, pro uh, cost efficient approach in the executive branch agencies to the consumption of, of, of IT services. Second, I think we all can agree that the system's performance has suffered at times because of communication breakdowns between the key stakeholders. This must be addressed in ways to create a more customer-friendly environment uh, in, uh, at VITA, which is focused on the delivery of efficient and necessary IT services in the agencies. And third, while the governance structure that was put in place for this system has, uh, uh, is, is very creative and has produced a number of advantages, we must find ways to increase the accountability of VITA to the governor who, as the chief executive officer for the state, is ultimately responsible for the performance of his agencies. Working closely with legislative uh, leaders like Delegate Nixon, who I believe is here today, we are, and the ITIB board, we're very hopeful that, this, that the proposal that we will roll out this morning um, will reach the governor's desk at the end of the session with the blessing and support of the General Assembly. Now, what I would like to do is turn the program over to Secretary Chopra, and he will walk you through some of the uh, proposed reforms we have discuss some of the support and rationale for the changes, and take any questions that you might have at the conclusion of his presentation. Again, thank you for coming, and we look forward to uh, moving forward with Vita. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be with you. I know this is a busy time of year. Uh, we did this on purpose, because we want to listen to your thoughts, your concerns, your feedback, while it's still possible to infect change. And I'm really thankful in this extremely busy environment that Delegate Nixon has taken the time to join us today uh, to hear our concerns directly and to work with us as we hear uh, areas in which we can work together and make improvements. So what I would like to do is provide us a little bit of background. I will frame the IT governance challenge more generally. 
I will end with a few remarks about a path forward and uh, our alignment with our new president's open government agenda, and then facilitate a discussion with all of you. Many of you in the room are agency heads or IT leaders. The good news is I've seen so many of your faces and worked with you on so many projects, it'll be almost like family talking with one another about the challenges. And uh, would welcome to hear any uh, specific areas in which we can take action during this session. So let me put the uh, context. Uh, as you heard from Wayne, we were very proud of our results in the governing magazine, uh, Pew Charitable Trust, Grading the States Initiative in 2008. When you look at the data that helped us earn the A minus grade tied for the best in the nation, if you looked at the issue of information itself, which is one of the subcategories that they monitor, Virginia's A grade was at the very top of the nation. And in my view, it's because we're grounded in such strong IT leadership. Now, to put this into perspective, this is an area of responsibility that I serve on behalf of Governor Kane. What you see in front of you is the sum total of the work that I do for the governor, uh, supporting areas of our government operations agenda, uh, working to see if we can advance the governor's goals in health care and education and so forth through technology, and to stimulate Virginia's technology economy. The purpose of our discussion today is the left-hand side of my responsibilities, the bulk of my responsibilities, <coughs> how we managed IT to simplify government operations. In December of this year, of this past year, the governor introduced a budget. And in that budget, we took several actions, some of which were uh, more legislative oriented with respect to the budget, but they were actions nonetheless that we presented in the uh, budget document. What I thought I might do is provide you a little bit of the context of that action and then follow with the subsequent legislation that we've been working very closely with Delegate Nixon on. First and foremost, uh, you heard from Wayne Turnage that there's been a challenge with respect to cost pressures in the uh, partnership that we funded through the uh, Northrop Grumman Public-Private Partnership. Let me explain this in a little bit greater detail because I think this is one of the areas that's been uh, complicated for us to communicate. The Commonwealth, as a single unit, entered into an agreement with Northrop Grumman. And that agreement essentially held flat our infrastructure obligations over the course of a 10-year period, with some minor adjustments, but for the most part, has held us flat. And the truth is that we have been flat in our payments to Northrop Grumman with respect to that bolus of funding. So the Commonwealth in its relationship to Northrop Grumman isn't very complicated. It's actually relatively straightforward. What has been complicated is how we produce the revenues to cut that single check to Northrop Grumman. Now let me put it to you in as simple a terms as I can because it gives you the flavor for why this has become more complicated. The original idea was pretty simple. If we're going to cut a single check, then let's just turn to every agency and say, for every amount of money you spent last year, hold it flat too. Because if we hold the individual agencies flat, then the collective unit is flat and we can cut the check to Northrop Grumman. Many of you recall this as the MOU process. We were going agency by agency and asking you to pay a flat rate for what you were paying historically for your infrastructure costs. In the midst of our MOU discussions with all of you, the federal government, through its cost allocation principles, sent us a letter that said that would not comply with their interpretation of fair uh, billing practices. Now, why is that? Well, in my computer in the governor's office, I have a certain amount of email storage. Let's assume I have five megabits of storage. And I might have paid X dollars for that service, and I would have been flat. In the, uh, uh, in the model that we had set up on MOUs. Now, Billy over here is in uh, planning and budget, and he might have had two megabits of storage. And so when Billy factored in the costs that he had incurred, it may ultimately be that I'm paying a little bit less than Billy, and I'm getting a little bit more in terms of storage than Billy. If Billy was federally funded, then the federal government perceived as him getting uh, basically charged more for the same good or service that I was going to be charged for uh, as someone that was supported out of the general fund. In other words, we needed to break down every single unit of service, assign a uniform rate, compile all of that in a spreadsheet, 
and translate that into a billing system that sends you a reflection of how those rates applied to your usage patterns uh, occurs. Now, why is that a challenge? The, cha now, the net total is, again, the Northrop Grumman relationship to Virginia is flat. So that part has stayed simple. What has been complicated is how does that translate into your bills? So you would have experienced, for some of you, a significant increase because perhaps your usage patterns relative to the usage patterns of the Commonwealth might have been a deviation. And when there's a single price for a megabit of email storage, and that applies to you, me sitting here at 10 megabits or 5 megabits of storage, my bill would have gone up two or threefold for what I perceive is the same level of service. So as we trickled down those rates to all of you, what we started to understand in that uh, breakdown was a really interesting anomaly. For whatever reason, those uh, agencies that rely more heavily on the general fund, that is the state's taxpayers' dollars, ended up bearing the brunt of the higher costs, if you will, in aggregate, whereas many of you in the non-general fund component, some of you, not all, had seen reductions. Again, the net total in what we paid in Northrop Grumman flat. <coughs> now, why do I describe that for you? Because as a budgetary matter, we made a commitment to you. And I say we, meaning the uh, previous administration and this administration, a commitment to the agencies that we would effectively hold you harmless for the transformation program. So now we have a quandary. An unexpected federal intervention has caused us to change the way we recapture the revenues to pay the partnership, and it turns out that it bears disproportionately on the state's general fund. Now, we had observed this phenomenon early at the end of 2006 calendar year when we began to change the billing methodology. And as we introduced the 09-010 the uh, the budget, Governor Kane had introduced a placeholder of about $9.5 million in each of the years of the biennium based on our best assumptions, attaboy Billy, our best assumptions to, to calculate what is that impact on the general fund. Again, the intention was to hold agencies harmless so that for that base level of infrastructure service, you would have effectively the same rate. It's just that it'll have to be paid for out of this central account that we had set up to buffer whatever the challenges were. And in this year's budget, we recognize that as we've proceeded with inventories and reconciling our assets as we know them today, our assumptions that nine and a half million in each year of the budget found out that they were a bit insufficient. Okay? They were insufficient. So what we have done in the introduced budget is we've asked that fiscal $10 be moved into fiscal 9 so that we have greater visibility in the gap in 09. We think it to be 13 million. So we've moved some of the money from year 2 into year 1. That leaves us a bit of a hole in fiscal 10. Now, many of you are aware of our economic climate. It was not likely that we could add more to that buffer account. So we found ourselves in a bit of a quandary. How do we maintain our commitment to hold agencies harmless for the partnership on the core infrastructure without jeopardizing the overall revenue streams that would, have, that would fund the transformation? So the second action that we've taken, and this is one that I will show great leadership for those who serve voluntarily, I might add, on our IT investment board. We have nine members of the public, or eight members of the public plus myself and the, the auditor, who serve on the uh, IT investment board. And through d discussions directly between the governor and the board chair, we agreed to a, a compromise, which was this. If we moved some of the funding into year one, that the IT board would take responsibility to fulfill any of the remaining gap to hold the general fund of the agencies harmless with respect to transformation. We do not have a final number for what the fiscal 10 impact will be. We have not yet completed the inventory process. We hope to do that by March or April of this year. But 
the commitment, the budgetary commitment, is that any gap that remains between what that core infrastructure rate is and what the agency has paid historically, that that gap will be found by work done by the IT Investment Board. Now, you might be wondering, why is that an action the IT Board is willing to take? How on earth will they find the gap, the savings to fund the gap? That is why Chief Turnage just referenced the idea that we want to change the nature of what the IT Board can review. As of today, the IT Board essentially has visibility into your infrastructure spending. They have some visibility into your major IT projects governed by VITA's Project Management Division and minor, but for the most part, the major projects, but has limited visibility into how you run or you finance the support to your legacy applications. So as part of this agreement, the governor has agreed that the IT Investment Board shall have a more holistic picture of what we spend with respect to information technology investments so that we can manage the entirety of the budget to find savings that would allow us to close that gap. You'll hear more about that in a minute. Now, how do we do that today? Many of you work very closely with Peggy Feldman, who's sitting in our front row. Peggy, you can wave. Peggy serves as the director of the Enterprise Applications Program, which I'll talk about momentarily. But she also serves, according to our work done in, in January of 2008, she serves as the governor's chief applications officer, an attempt to help us better understand how we are managing our applications. And I'll share with you a little bit about that work as well. So it was natural in discussions with the IT Investment Board that if we were to take a look at the entirety of the picture for IT, that we assign those responsibilities to Peggy and transfer her division under the supervision of the IT Investment Board to take advantage of all the experience and all the collaboration that she's garnered in working with you for the past year, year and a half. So that last bullet is that we essentially consolidate all of our IT governance through a combination of the Enterprise Applications Program and VITA and allow the board to take a holistic view. But again, the root cause, driver, is to ensure that we can hold you harmless for the Infrastructure Modernization Program. That's how these two come together. Now, to put some numbers on the page, you see the Auditor of Public Accounts in uh, the fall of 2007, or I guess winter, I guess, if you look at the dates, uh, published a report that served as the building blocks of our discussion of why we want to engage at the totality of IT governance, not just the infrastructure. What the auditor showed us is that out of the state's $600 million in spend for fiscal year 2007 for IT, and by the way, that's an estimate that does not include those spend at higher education institutions, but the $600 plus million dollars in spend roughly speaking, breaks down that about half of that is spent on infrastructure. And it was judged that that bolus of funding was well managed and market competitive. That the work we do around new projects in fiscal seven, that was about 16% of that spend, had the appropriate oversight with respect to the IT board, and had been successful in eliminating some of the failures that had been reported by an earlier JLARC study in 2003 that had noted nearly $100 million in cost overruns and failures to, IT, to selected IT projects. But the remaining third that we all used to fund our day-to-day -day operations lacked formal oversight from the IT Investment Board and had been presumed to be inefficient. Now, I had wonderful conversations with many of you and uh, we're questioning that assumption that the maintenance and operations piece had been presumed inefficient. And I would agree that there's lack of visibility into the efficiency of that uh, pot of funding. And so it's left to interpretation whether you would assume it to have been efficient or inefficient. But nevertheless, it is a pot of money that we hadn't tracked. Given this reality and the budgetary actions that you'd seen, it became very clear that what was needed to be done with respect to the changes in IT governance that, that we had just described 
really required a legislative approach more so than an attempt to tinker through the budget with some of these dramatic changes. And it is in that context that we were grateful that Delegate Nixon had served up as an opportunity, uh, created an opportunity to provide legislation to address this issue. And from the very first day, approached this subject as a collaborative endeavor with leaders from the IT Investment Board, VITA, the governor's office, and the legislative uh, staff and uh, several key members. So a collaborative effort, and in a sense, a, an approach to tackle the key root cause challenges that the auditor had outlined back in his report on IT governance in 2007. You can't read my Word document writing, but what it basically does is it categorizes four elements that the auditor felt we needed to do to strengthen our approach to IT governance. First, is to ensure that we've got appropriate oversight and reporting in the totality of IT, and that is to get picture, uh, a visibility into the full pie. Well, the governor has agreed to add that responsibility to the chief applications officer and add those if she were to transfer into VITA under the supervision of the ITIB as responsibilities of the ITIB. Second, that there needs to be some funding mechanism to encourage shared services, to improve project oversight, and so forth. Now, the reality is, in an ideal world, we would have a plethora of funding to run governance at a rate that many would consider to be appropriate. But we are where we are. We are confident that between the current general fund support we've made available to provide support to the Enterprise Applications Director, and the general fund support that we've made available to VITA to govern project management, that the combination of the two in a merged environment would allow for sufficient funding to carry out the responsibilities that address that governance challenge. Next, one of the key insights, one of the reasons why we're so proud that we've made the hire of, of Peggy Feldman, when we interviewed Peggy, and many of you in the room joined us in that interview process, she provided a pretty significant insight. That is, prior to her interviews, we were focused on applications, applications, applications. We want to buy one big mega beast of an application system, and all of you have to plug into it. Or we want to you know, strip away all that you're doing and have a single mega system. We were very application-centric. The insight that Peggy produced when she was interviewing was that really the future is to focus on data harmony, less the applications challenge. We might have applications that will be modernized or those that will remain in legacy, COBOL, green screen for many years to come. But it is our ability to access the data and to use that information to make better decisions on behalf of our citizenry. That's the secret sauce. So in that shift from an applications-centric approach to modernization to a data-centric approach to modernization, we've clearly set ourselves up to look at the data standards so we can make better judgments. How many of you in this room have applications that have to code in the person's name, address, uh, you know, phone number, maybe social? I bet you the demographics of Anish Chopra appear in no less than a dozen state agency databases. I will also guarantee you that the actual syntax of my name and the characters associated with my address and some are not going to be the exact same in each of those. Some will have my middle initials, some will not. Some will truncate my address, some will expand. So our ability to have a harmonized approach to some of that data, presuming a common standard for demographics as an example, requires us to have governance to be able to set those standards. And that is now an assigned responsibility in a formal sense to the chief applications officer and again under the supervision of the IT Investment Board. The other dream scenario is that we think about how we budget for new systems in a different way. You know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that to modernize all of our financial systems in the Commonwealth will not happen on nickels and dimes we can scrape together, as David so kindly points out to me every time we discuss the issue. This will be a significant investment for the Commonwealth. We today have a mechanism for budgeting for projects that are of long-term value. We have a capital budget in the uh, legislative process, but that applies to buildings and so forth. We today don't have a capital budgeting process for long-term investments like IT systems, 
So the auditor did recommend that we think about a new approach for budgeting those systems. And while we have no answers to that recommendation, we encourage the IT board and its totality of its oversight to responsibilities to think about ways that we can address these long-term funding challenges uh, that we know don't necessarily get the top of mind attention, especially when we have to fully fund our schools and public safety and so forth. Uh, a bolus of money to buy a software package to run payroll isn't exactly high on the list of public sector priorities. So with that background, I want to share one more thing before I get to that slide, by the way. Um, what I did not put on graphic, but I do want to convey to you is critical, is that when the chief described for you the distance that today exists between the CIO, who is an independent uh, agent of government, and the governor, who serves as the chief executive for all of you, that that distance is one that we understand has to shrink in order to accomplish all that we've talked about. Now, this hasn't been finalized yet, but we do have through legislation. All that I described earlier are actions the governor has agreed to make. Now we are in a legislative environment, and under Delegate Nixon's bill, there is an attempt to, to close that gap and to do so with uh, basically three primary actions. Action number one, today the IT board has nine voting members and a non-voting member, which is the Auditor of Public Accounts. That makes 10, vote, 10 uh, members of the board. With a, four to four, uh, with, a, with a five to four uh, vote today, our, our tiebreaker is a really interesting animal. The tiebreaker is uh, the, the legislature appoints four, the governor appoints four, and the tiebreaker is that the legislature provides a dozen or so names, and the governor selects amongst those names for that tie-breaking vote. It's a little bit of an interesting uh, animal. I don't know how many other examples of that in board structures there are. What the delegate has proposed is that that last tiebreaker no longer come from this convoluted uh, n nominations and selection process, but be a permanently named uh, ex officio member of the board. And that is that second component, which is that we're going to name the Secretary of Finance as a permanent member of the board. We do that because the Secretary of Finance has the closest visibility on the budgetary impact of the partnership. And in light of the discussion I had with you earlier about the impact on the general fund and the cost allocation rules, that's really the sweet spot and the domain expertise of our Secretary of Finance. And we are blessed in the Kane administration to have sort of a guru in that job in Rick Brown. So we are really blessed, should this legislation move forward, that we will have sort of world-class talent day one to help inform that, that aspect. So what that effectively does is provide the governor's office, if you will, effectively five votes out of the nine on the, on the appointments to the board. Now that's an important point because it sends a pretty dramatic signal to the chief information officer as to where and whom they shall focus their energies with respect to their day-to-day -day operational res, res, uh, activities. The, the third aspect of what was called for by legislation is that the Secretary of Technology, acknowledging that in many ways I serve as the policy advisory function to the governor on matters of IT, shall be named the permanent vice chair of the board. And in that capacity has responsibility to serve on every single committee, the finance committee, the uh, executive evaluation committee, the infrastructure committee, the solutions committee, and so forth, so that the policy goals of the governor can be reflected in all the operational aspects of the IT board. Now, we do this by vice chair on purpose because to some degree we wish to insulate the operations of the board from political whim and that the next governor, whomever that may be, when they appoint a secretary of technology r without worrying about a shift, seismic shift in their direction, there will be at least a, a check on that risk by having a, a member of the public who has the quality and the experience that's designated for in the board uh, requirements. They have to have been an executive of a technology company with 50 million in revenue and so forth. That that be the reserve for the chairmanship, if you will, and as a result, that there'll be some continuity in our work. So the vice chair role allows the governor to have policy influence over all aspects of the IT investment board, but 
has a check and balance there so that we don't go too far afoul in the next administration. It's a compromise balance that I think strikes the right, uh, the right tone. Now, just as context today, I effectively only have visibility into the project review cycle on the IT Investment Board. I do not serve on the Finance Committee, which sets the billing rates. I do not serve on the Executive Evaluation Committee, where a lot of these customer service issues would be important as they represent a third of the CIO's evaluation. Uh, and I will be moving forward uh, based on this uh, an, uh, action. So that's the legislative slash governor's budgetary approach that today sits as sort of a two-tiered model. And again, with your feedback the rest of this morning as I wrap up my remarks, you will be in a position to help us ensure that this conforms to your concerns and so forth. Now, I'm going to share a few words about each of the specific aspects of where we are in transformation, just so that we're all on the same page. And then I'll end with my final remarks on the path forward. Let me begin. You heard Chief Turnage talk about the transformation that we've entered into, the public-private partnership with Northrop Grumman. That is running on track. Now, how do we know it's running on track? You cannot read this slide, and that's why I'm telling you we're running on track. Uh, but what this slide represents, and this is an important point, the partnership, as it has evolved, has changed its customer focus. This is an important point that I want to share with you. The partnership began by looking at IT transformation by subject matter. That is, what will we do to modernize the network? How will we refresh everyone's desktop computers? What are we going to do to, common, to establish a common messaging environment? How do we bring your servers into a unified uh, structure? And so forth. When we had that model, the agencies themselves just sort of stacked one against the other as to the subject of the tower at hand. So when you were told, we'd like to do desktop refresh, the next week someone else might walk into your office and say, I'm here to talk to you about messaging. And then the next week someone would say, do you I want to talk to you about help desk? Now that was a tower-centric approach to the partnership. With your feedback and with the governor's support, the Northrop Grumman Vita partnership has agreed to change the focus. Effective today, we are now looking at transformation at the agency level. Drafts are flying back and forth that express to you in a very brief one to two pager how transformation will work for your agency. So David Von Maul, you will say, on this date, you go to network transformation. On this date, we do PC refresh. In this date range, we deal with server consolidation. And you can look at the totality of the program in one coherent way as an agency leader you would like to have it seen. What you have in this graphic represents the top 20 plus agencies that account for roughly 90% of our IT infrastructure spend. And the board has asked to see almost sort of day by day war room like data on the performance of those top agencies. The Northrop Grumman leadership from the president of the Northrop Grumman IT division all the way through the governor's leadership, which is the chief of staff, we have, week, we have uh, periodic war room meetings. We've been doing them every, other, every two or three weeks or so. War room like meetings to review the status of these 20 plus agencies so that we know are we on track or off track. This is getting very high visibility, both within Northrop Grumman and within the governor's office because we are so deeply committed to making sure this works. As of the board meeting in January, which is just about two or three weeks ago, about 55% of transformation was complete. Now that's sort of a index, if you will, a number that represents the sum total of all activities, transformation on networks and messaging and so forth. And you can see the breakdown by tower and you can, I hope we'll post this. I'll post my slides on my technology.virginia.gov website. You can download them so you can see this. But it's very important that you know where you stand in this area because this is where both uh, the Northrop Grumman team and uh, uh, Chief Turnage will be calling on you to say, are we making progress? Where are we on transformation and so forth? Please note that this is also going to form the basis of that one to two page summary document that you'll be getting from the partnership so that you can 
push back or react or compromise or negotiate. So as uh, Lan and I were talking about, we don't have circumstances where servers or other critical assets are going through transformation right in the middle of when the agencies uh, uh, get there. So, so, so the premise of all this is that we will, we will have a more unified approach with respect to infrastructure. Second, I wanted you to be aware of the pace, okay? Transformation's been going on since 2005, 2006. We announced it in 05, we began in 06. On the left-hand side of the graphic, you will see what amounts to the pace at which we've been adding agencies to the network, okay? Or I should say units to the network. I want you to see the skew of bars on the right-hand side. That is the new pace we will have to add organizations to the network in order to meet our transformation goals and timeline. That, my friends, is an accelerated pace. But I assure you, Northrop Grumman and its partners, Verizon Business, have basically staffed up dramatically dozens and dozens of additional FTEs to support the network migration. So this is where we are on infrastructure. I'm going to say a word about applications, and I'm going to wrap back up on the implications on budget. So you saw infrastructure as one of the thirds of the pie. That, I, that the auditor described. Now we'll talk about the applications piece, the new projects, which are really ad, uh, applications. This slide really, in my view, captures the spirit of the Kane administration more generally, and what I hope is the spirit of Commonwealth that, it, we, that is sort of imbued in the culture of where we are, and that is that we work together and we collaborate a lot more. On the left-hand side represents how we look at the pie of applications that you all have purchased over the years. We have a few enterprise applications today, and payroll, and financials, and procurement, and, and HR. There are a couple of shared services, what we would call service bureaus. We've got a payroll service bureau with Von Mall. We've got an HR service bureau with Sarah Wilson, uh, and so forth and so on. And then the bulk of you have agency applications that, to some degree, have components that would be useful to all of you, but you all replicate them, if you will. And that's the world in which we live in. We have no less than eight agencies of government who regulate and license businesses. I was laughing yesterday. I was sitting at the uh, Senate Finance Committee hearing uh, trying to share some, some positive words on a, on a bill on PPEA modernization. And I was just sitting there for an hour because it was sort of, the, I was last in the queue, I guess. I don't know, I was just sitting there having fun. But while I was there, I was listening to a piece of legislation. Um, we have a de Department of Professional and Occupational Regulation that handles a lot of agent industries for, for, for licensing. But it turns out locksmiths are actually licensed by, I think, DCJS or whatever. OK. So we license people over here, but then locksmiths get licensed over here. I'm sure there's a very thoughtful and appropriate reason why that happens. But from a technology standpoint, an engine that processes the license for a contractor, the marginal cost of performing the marginal cost of, 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 of producing a locksmith license is minimal. But by having it in separate agencies where you have to buy separate software to process all this stuff, we're not necessarily benefiting from a shared service. So that's the world we live in today. Under the leadership of Peggy Feldman and by the way, can you all show hands? How many of you are working with Peggy on any committees, on data standards, on applications? Raise your hands if you don't mind. Wow. That probably represents 80% of the agencies in the room. Thank you, by the way, for your time, because I know we don't pay you for that work. That's about your time at your, uh, at your ledger. So uh, I greatly appreciate your support. But with all of your working together, we've seen a vision of the future that's on the right-hand side. That is a strengthened set of enterprise applications that we've all agreed to perform. This is the core of our public-private partnership with CGI, that we would expand the number of collaborative services. You know, one of the things that I love in my job is that I don't have a lot of mandatory th powers to force you to do the things. 99% of the projects that I work on involve at least two agencies. And you all come together on your own. 
And it's a remarkable thing to watch the enjoyment of people who hadn't necessarily worked together in a formal sense come together on a common purpose and achieve remarkable things. This tower of collaborative applications will really strengthen that. That is voluntarily coming together to share common capabilities so that we could all benefit. One plus one should equal 1.5, not two. Coming together will deliver efficiencies. And we can talk more about some of the ideas that are there. Now, obviously, you will still have some very detailed agency applications that are purely in your domain that don't really touch anybody else. And that's, God bless you, have at it. But we really need to grow that gray area. Grow the gray. That's the challenge that we're going to have on our new projects. So what is our path forward with respect to enterprise applications? Our path forward does the following. As many of you know, to modernize our core HR, payroll, all those components, uh, we established a public-private partnership with CGI that rested on the following proposition. Without having to tip, uh, tap into general fund dollars in any significant way, we could, by strengthening our ability to capture cost recoveries or to improve our debt collections and so forth, we can generate enough incremental profit, if you will, to put into a fund and modernize those applications. Well, we've had some success in that regard. We've had a working partnerships with the tax department. Uh, anyone here from tax, I thank you for your leadership. Thank you, folks. Where we have been essentially throwing the dog pile, is the way I would describe it, the dog pile of bad debt to the partnership. And they've been able to squeeze revenue out of that turnip, or whatever the expression is. And that revenue is now being analyzed to say, what would, that, what would we have been able to capture separately? How do you benchmark this and all the rest? And that the incremental of that shall flow back into an account that will fund all of our modernization activities. Well, Secretary Brown is so deeply committed to finding these revenue opportunities. Um, I'm pleased to report that he's announced David Von Maul will serve as his senior advisor to bird dog these leads over the coming years so that we have a sufficient revenue stream to allow us to begin developing those enterprise applications. That's the supply side, right? That's the cash to fund the partnership. Now what are we going to do with the money? Well, we do have a working capital advance that the governor has put forward that would allow Peggy's team, you in a collaborative way, to tap into $30 million of working capital that would be paid back from those revenues that Von Maul will be bird dogging. And in that working capital advance, we have specific funds targeted to the applications that we're working on. We have several in planning phase. That is, we're working with VDOT on an enterprise-wide approach to financials that many of you have served on, so that the VDOT system will essentially involve a base replacement for cars. Very creative uh, partnership, if you will, and uh, one that is now going through procurement. We are also working on HR under Sarah's leadership, and that too will unfold in the coming months. We are in active procurement mode on a brand new budgeting system. We've already completed procurement on a Commonwealth approach to reporting and business intelligence. We've established major IT projects under Val Thompson's leadership uh, in DEQ, where we've got an enterprise approach to content management and soon to be announced a shared service, where I, hold, where I shared earlier the idea that 1 plus 1 should equal 1.5. We will have that model so that if you all want to avail yourselves of the capabilities of the IBM FileNet uh, document management capability, that you will avail yourself through a shared service program that will be cheaper than if you were to buy it on your own. By the way, cheaper not just in its actual licensing costs, but cheaper in its Vita bills associated with the infrastructure. And uh, Peggy's got a great story with you about how that, that, that data will be saved. We also have a series of strategic initiatives that are technically designated as minor projects around digital signatures and web services and customer-facing one-stops. And we're also implementing some of that work around the applications governance program, the stuff that I talked about earlier. Now, some of this is going to be paid back by David finding the revenue. Some of this was coming out of the general fund appropriation that came out of last year's, or the two-year budget previously, which was about $11 million of planning money. And some of it is going to be paid back by all of you through MOUs. Okay, and I'll share with you an example of that. Now, for many of you wondering where does all of this come together, if we were to take this approach to applications, this data-centric model, 
merge it in with Vita and consolidate IT governance, what's the vision? It is important for you all to understand that the, the key pillar of what we do in enterprise applications is to enable our commonwealth by providing effective, efficient, necessary, and secure applications to meet the needs of our citizenry, our businesses, and the government itself. But this will be accomplished by providing delivery mechanisms that allow customers to serve themselves. Self-service, as you know, is much cheaper. My good friend D.B. Smith here will tell you it's a heck of a lot cheaper for folks to renew their vehicle registration online than when they walk into a service center. So self-service enablement critical. Applications that enable the delivery of efficient and effective services more generally, and a unified framework for applications governance, planning, and so forth. All of this in a secure and trusted environment. Our sole intent with this endeavor, under Peggy's leadership, is to create efficient and effective business capabilities while optimizing the dollars we spend. We can't do this without multi-agency collaboration. And because of the, all of you raising your hands, we have great confidence. Chief, you have confidence? We have confidence that under Peggy's leadership, we'll work together. Now, what does Peggy do for the Commonwealth? Peggy wears two hats. She serves as our Chief Applications Officer. And in that capacity, she manages the portfolio of applications. As you all have been very gracious to provide data, in, in, uh, in the last several months, you've all been submitting information, very detailed information. We know that at a minimum, we have nearly 2,000 agency applications in our portfolio. 20% of them are going to be replaced in the coming years. Big question, do we replace them one for one? Do we go from 2,000 to 1,700? Is our end goal to go from 2,000 to 50? We need to have someone in a collaborative way work with all of you to think about these issues. We need those data standards. We've added to the chief applications component the responsibilities, and this is important. We want the ability for Peggy to review your overall application budget. Now, this is the sticky wicket, OK? She's not going to micromanage every nickel and dime you, you do. You don't have to say, mother, may I, every time you want to do something in IT. But when you sit down with DPB to work out your budgets, Peggy's going to be sitting right there with Don Dar and Billy and company to sit down and ask you all the tough questions and the nice questions on how the application's budget will fold. It is in that exercise that we can uncover areas where we could collaborate that you might not be aware of because you just didn't know. When Todd Richardson says, I want to do a little electronic permitting thing for my mining people, and I want them to sign their applications online, I need a digital signature. Can I, this modest agency in commerce and trade, can I, can I do a digital signature? And then all of a sudden, Morley Rao from VDOT says, hey, man, this is something I care about too, and on and on. We come together because we uncover these opportunities, and that's what we're going to do with Peggy. Also. We've added the responsibility, and this is not going to be all that happy for you. We do think that the management of contractors today really lacks a, a thoughtful governance model. When we instituted controls during budget cutting, all of you had to go to your cabinet secretary to sign off on any time you wanted to use a contractor. Rather than going to your secretary, you will now have to go to Peggy. That one may not be all that happy. I'll hear that feedback. But it's important for us for us to get a true picture of what we're doing. Then on the right, we'll continue our work on enterprise applications, the central systems, those collaborative systems, and so forth. Now, before I end and give you my final remarks about a path forward, I want to make this comment. The IT board has made the following commitment. Should all of this come under the unified structure of VITA, the ITIB will absolutely take a hard look at the operations of VITA. And as part of our approach to closing the gap, we have a firm commitment that not only will it come out of the work that we're going to be doing on these agency applications reviews, but will come out of the operations of VITA itself. And I want to acknowledge that because everyone's going to have to play a part in order to achieve the cost targets we need to fully fund and hold harmless the infrastructure bills, and over time to make sure that we're providing appropriate oversight. Thankfully, the timing of this with JLARC allows us to have an independent voice into the operational 
performance of Vita itself, which will be a good source of information to know whether or not it's sized right by functional area. And I might add, and last but not least, uh, for those of you that are, that are not aware, uh, we are beginning the search for a new CIO. Our current CIO will end his contract formally, uh, I guess it's the end of February, and will stay on in, a, in an advisory capacity to the Commonwealth for, for a, a period up to a year while we transition a, 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 a search process for a new CIO. It is absolutely positively sure that a new CIO, as they are recruited into the organization, will have as his or her very first tax, task a review of the organizational structure itself. So you'll have a JLARC voice, you'll have a new CIO, you'll have a board that's committed to take a look, you'll have a restructured approach to applications with Peggy's introduction to Vita. All of that will give with great confidence that we will emerge from this experience with a stronger, more efficient, and more effective IT approach to governance. That's my formal remarks to you on the big picture, legislative and budgetary. I now want just a few minutes on where we are on the path forward, and then uh, I will ask if Delegate Nixon wishes to say a word. If not, we will have uh, uh, the open remarks for, for all of you. Now, this is the fun part. That was the tough part. Okay, now for the fun part. On day one, our new president issued an executive directive calling for a new approach to IT. And that new approach to IT had three pillars. That our government should be transparent, our government should be participatory, and our government should be collaborative. And in uh, President Obama's work, he's directed his yet to be named chief technology officer to report a plan to accomplish these goals within 120 days. I wanted you all to be aware that we in the Commonwealth are fully aligned to those goals by sharing with you how we are and to welcome and encourage you to have ideas, suggestions, opportunities, so that we can be fully aligned when the new president, when the president uh, performs his duties. On transparency, there's no greater initiative that we have in the Commonwealth than Virginia performs. This has been the key to our winning the Best Managed State uh, Award by governing, and has probably been, of all the operational responsibilities of Governor Kane, probably amongst the very top of his uh, accomplishments. For those of you that are not aware of version 2.0, coming attractions, this will be available in the next week or two. All of you are submitting new data this week for your uh, 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 various measures. The key to our transparency is threefold. One, you all have established key measures that define what your agency does. And those measures are now uh, publicly available and searchable. They have been since 2006. Second, we all used to have a management scorecard with a series of core uh, capabilities. That management scorecard is birthed anew as a series of administrative measures. Under Sarah Wilson's leadership and with a collaborative number of agencies who've been working together to set that new set of administrative measures, those will be circulated and shared and uh, will be a wonderful way to celebrate the great work we're doing to be proper stewards of taxpayer dollars. And third, most important in my mind, because it's of, of great personal interest to me, we will be the very first state in the entire country to publish productivity measures for every single agency. You have spent the last year working very hard with planning and budget to determine what your measure of productivity shall be. And we will release to the public those ideas. My man DB has offered to be uh, our first pilot in this endeavor because he's got great data. DB will tell you that it is overall more costly for us to administer the vehicle registration renewal program than the marginal revenues we can retain from the fees generated by the public. So our ultimate goal obviously has to transfer the cost structure to be in line with the revenues we collect. And this chart gives you an illustration of how DB's management style will help us get there. He acknowledged that the overall cost is high, but when you break down that cost into its component parts, it is more expensive for you to be serviced in-house than to serve you by phone or, or mail or internet. So by shifting the demand towards the internet channels and the less costly channels, the DMV select programs and the like, 
DB will be managing more aggressively that particular productivity measure. Second pillar, participatory government. This is one that just brings a tear to my eye because my man, Lan Nugent over here at the Department of Education, he's a great guy. When we did our productivity investment fund, by the way, you all applied to get your grants from the state's uh, innovation fund, if you will. The Department of Education alone accounted for 25% of the applications we received. A litany of innovation in education. And one of my favorite projects is a participatory project. In 2010, the Board of Education will release its brand new standards for physics as part of the science SOL process. But a team of experts under Governor Kane's stewardship that were tasked by Secretary Morris looked at the subject of physics, read our standards, and said, we are really lacking in some of the emerging areas. You know, it's important in Virginia that we get modeling and simulation right, because we have a huge job growth potential in that field. Yet we have no course content in our schools formalized to teach modeling and simulation and the physics of it to our kids. It matters a great deal that we focus on, and this is one that annoyed the heck out of me, we still teach kids that the main component of a television is the cathode ray tube. Y'all gonna watch Super Bowl Sunday? I got a beautiful TV in my house. It ain't a cathode ray tube, I folks. It's a beautiful uh, uh, LCD. So we, we still teach the cathode ray tube. And what's galling is that we used to manufacture them in Danville. They stopped manufacturing the product in 2006, laid off 150 people. Yet their kids come home and tell mommy and daddy, I'm so proud of you because you still work in an area that's important to our television. Give me a break. Well, we understand that we need to teach our kids about plasmas and LCDs and so forth. And there are a variety of other subjects. But you know what, folks? We had no money. We have no program. But we had an opportunity for the citizenry of Virginia to participate. Secretary Morris and I issued a challenge in September and said, anybody want to volunteer to write a chapter in a new online open source textbook compilation of, 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 of educational materials? Under Land's leadership, under the Department of Education, really under Dr. Wright's leadership, we've now got a program that would allow individuals in the general public to write chapters that will be quality controlled by a professor at William & Mary, William and Mary, peer reviewed, and we even got two high school students to volunteer to read the content to make sure it's usable. This will be published at the end of the month. But here's a coming attraction. This is the chapter on gravitation, written by Andy Jackson in Harrisonburg, a teacher for nearly 20 years. What a great man. He understood that today, the topic of dark matter, which is extremely controversial in the physics world, is one where nobody in high school physics is ever exposed. What on earth is dark matter? Well, I'll teach it to you some other day, but I'll tell you the highlight of it is that the principles of gravity that have held since Newton has really discovered the field, when we study the expansion of the universe, those principles of gravity are not working. The gravity formulas do not explain the expansion rate of our universe. So physicists are struggling. Either our actual formulas are flawed, the entire foundation of physics and gravity is wrong, or there's some unexplained dark matter that we cannot see that is creating that expansionary effect. How many high school kids are exposed to this debate? Goose egg, folks, at least in a formal context. But they will be because good people in Virginia participated in the creation of this online resource, wrote this chapter, quality controlled, and aligned with our state standards. God bless. The last pillar is collaboration. I'm so proud of the work all of you have done. The tax department, DGS, DIMBY, the VEC, DBA, you all came together and said, you know what's really weird? When a person wants to start a new business in Virginia, each of us has to talk to them. We have to set up their tax oversight, their unemployment stuff, we got to make sure that they're uh, involved in our state procurement opportunities. We want to make sure that our SWAM vendors have exposure to opportunities. We got all kinds of ways in which we want to talk to that entrepreneur. But we make them talk to every one of our separate agencies, right? Silly. 
through collaboration and a very dinky $150,000 investment, in eight weeks, you all put together a website under Peggy's leadership and Wayne Waldrop as project manager at DBA, a, a one-stop system that, that basically asks, why do we have to ask the same question 100 times? What's your name? What's the business name? Let's just ask it once. And when you finish the interview process online, you push print, and all the forms you need to fill out get printed. You simply sign them and mail them, and you're off to the races. Wouldn't you know it, for that dinky $150,000 investment, eight weeks of development time, 5,000 businesses have used this service to register. And in our surveys, have saved between three and five business days without having to do all that paperwork. Now, 14 questions replace 107 data fields that have to be completed. Phase two will go online with no new general fund support because this collaboration will be self-financed. Now, Meg Whitman, the former CEO of eBay, flew to Watt to Northern Virginia in the height of the uh, uh, election season and said, I applaud, Vir I applaud Virginia for its commitment to entrepreneurship because it streamlined this registration process. And she gave a big shame on you to California because it's a lot better to do business in Virginia than it is in California. Last but not least, I want to sh shout out to my friends at DMAS, uh, my, under the leadership of Pat Finnerty, a man we all love, great guy. Pat has agreed that Medicaid needs to play in the sandbox of our overall healthcare ecosystem. And just in December, announced that Medicaid, alongside the largest health plans in Virginia and the largest health systems in Virginia, a collaboration that will streamline the administrative costs in our healthcare system. No mandated state law forcing this to happen. On their own, with Medicaid's leadership, the payers and providers have come together and collaborated to deliver a pretty powerful capability that will lower costs and improve the value of our commonwealth. That's our path forward in IT. I thank you for your time. Now, I will say, my dear friend, Delegate Nixon, would you wish to say a word or two? Please welcome Delegate Nixon. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you all for uh, allowing me, a legislative interloper, to be here with you this morning. Uh, I was just sitting in the audience and I realized as I was sitting there that the last time I was in this room was six years ago, and I think it was in the spring of 2003. That was the year that the legislation that established VITA was passed in law. And then Governor uh, Warner, along with Secretary Newstrom, stood on this stage and they gave me the privilege of standing here with them uh, when that law was, uh, was signed into law, that bill was signed into law. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm not going to take a lot of your time. I really wanted to be here today mostly as an observer. Uh, I know that I've had some interaction with some of you and gotten feedback as far as your opinions and frustrations and cheers and jeers about VITA and what we put into place about six years ago. I just want to give you a little bit of a perspective uh, as to sort of where we are and why we're here. Uh, the secretary stopped by my office, I think it was December 15th, it was the Tuesday before the governor uh, unveiled his budget, and the secretary stopped by to give me a courtesy call, primarily for the purpose of telling me what the uh, proposals would be in the governor's budget relative to VITA and some restructuring that the governor wanted to perform, wanted to achieve. Uh, at that same time, I revealed to the secretary, ironically, that I told him that for the last two or three months, or the previous two or three months, that I had been working on a piece of legislation they would attempt to do something somewhat similar. So we sort of sat aside or put aside our different approaches to solving that problem, and we talked at a very macro level about what the administration's goals were, the, the problems they were trying to solve, and what the problems were as I saw them, the challenges. And at the end of our discussion that we realized there was, there was really almost no difference of opinion between the two of us in terms, at a high level, what we wanted to achieve. You know, when we first put together VITA, one of the things that we thought someday might be an issue is the fact that between the ITIB, which is, you know, basically the way we structured it, it is the IT agency in the Commonwealth, and the chief executive, that there was, there was too much of a, there's too big a wall of separation 
between the governor and the agency primarily responsible for managing IT infrastructure in the Commonwealth. And in the early days, it worked pretty well. Well, now that we've gotten to the nitty gritty of really making this thing work, as all of you know, uh, the communication between the two has not, has, has not been that good. So on one hand, we have the, the governor and Veep, the cabinet secretaries, all of you. And on this side, we had uh, the ITIB, the CIO, and, and VITA itself. And slowly over time, it began to be sort of this kind of a situation. And what I was seeing was a, a governor who's elected by the people, who has a responsibility to get a job done, uh, who did not feel as though the IT structure was really vested in his success. And then I also saw an IT structure and people who were committed to their jobs feeling as though the governor was not necessarily vested in their success. So what we wanted to do was to make a change to the governance structure so that the governor was more vested in ITIB and the ITIB was more vested in all of your success. And I feel pretty confident that the, the changes that we have proposed will help us put us on that path of, get, of making that happen. Uh, I'm sure that some of you would probably prefer a different structure. Uh, some people would probably prefer something a little bit lighter than what we've put in place. But we also recognize that with this being the final year of the existing administration's tenure, that it didn't make too much sense to make too big a change at this point in time, given that a new governor will be elected in November, and that person certainly will have his own opinions about how to, how to manage it. But within the next year, I, I feel pretty confident, and I'm certainly very hopeful, uh, that we will be able to make that happen. Let me just make one other comment, because I'm really here, because I, I want to hear your feedback. I want to hear what you think about this. Uh, the, the legislature uh, is, is acutely aware and it's very concerned uh, that we need to make all of this work properly. Uh, as you know, I was the patron of the bill in 2003. I say that not to brag, I say that because I personally am very much vested in the success of how we manage IT resources in Virginia. Uh, in my personal life, there's rarely a day that goes by uh, that someone doesn't say something to me uh, about VITA or the ITIB, or some aspect uh, or some struggle maybe that one of you are, you are facing. I think the basic structure that we put in place in 2003 is sound, that the basic philosophy behind it made sense, but I think we need to make sure that it was working. So I just share that with you. I want you to know that um, I'm fully vested in making it work. Uh, it's, not about, uh, it's not about having my name on a bill. It's truly about doing what we think is the right thing. And uh, all of you, are, the, are the, the heart and soul of state government. Uh, your agencies, the people who work for you, uh, you're, the, you're, the, you're the folks that are interacting uh, with the citizens of the Commonwealth on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, your ability to do your jobs and fulfill your, uh, your responsibilities and your statutory responsibilities is extremely important. Uh, so uh, we're committed to making this work, and I just wanted to share that with you, and I very much appreciate the uh, opportunity to spend some time here with you this morning. So thank you for, thank you for letting me do this.